Uh, since March, we've been engaging with a group of six teen teenagers from Dunedin, exploring their attitudes and behaviors about what it's like to get around Dunedin these days as a young person, and what barriers they are faced with, and what decisions they have to make. For ease of discussion, we've divided the group into two panels of three. Please join me in welcoming the first half of our teen panel to the stage. I'd like to start off by saying that, um, just so everyone knows that, um, well, first of all, thank you for agreeing to participate to all six of you, um, and thank you for being here today. Um, um, we've discussed transport issues um, over the last few weeks with the, uh, the group, um, and we, um, we haven't prepared, or they haven't prepared stage answers to questions, and actually, they don't really know what we're going to ask them. So um, it is a true panel discussion. And um, the panel has asked me to let, tell you that if you have a question at any time during the panel discussion, please just jump in, raise your hand, and we'll be discussing with the audience and with the panel and within the panel. So it'll be, hopefully be quite dynamic. So um, any questions, just pipe right up. So um, I'd like to just um, uh, begin by having you guys introduce yourselves and tell everyone your name and your age and what is your license status. Hi, I'm Anna Marie Murphan. I'm 17. I go to Kevna College and I don't have my licence. I'm Charlotte Steele. I go to Kevna College. I'm 17 and I don't have my licence either. I'm Connor O'Neill. I'm also 17. I also go to Kevna College and I have my restricted licence. Thank you. So I think I want to start off by just asking if you guys have any thoughts about any of the speakers that you've seen so far today. Just an open question to all three of you. Well, I like the idea that perhaps cars are decreasing as a status symbol and instead we've got cell phones and technology because personally I would take um, a laptop <laughs> connected to the internet over a car. I was going to ask you. Good, okay, good. Yeah, I personally feel that um, and a change in the way that we transport ourselves is really important. I am concerned about the environment and our future and um, so yeah, I'm for decreasing car use. Um, but I feel that we really need to change like public transport systems and um, active transport to make it easier for us to take alternatives to just having a car. Um, yeah, I have a similar opinion to Anna-Marie. Um, it's easy to say that we should dec decrease car usage, but at the same time we need a solution to that. And in a hilly city like Dunedin, there's a lot of... Um, sort of school, schools like OB's, um, Kavna and uh, Otago Girls up on the hill. It is quite difficult sometimes to bike to those areas. So we do need to invest in a better transport option like public transports um, before we can say um, motor cars. You bring up the idea of the multimodal um, system that Todd spoke of earlier. Um, do, you, what, do you think that that would be, um, and this is again to all three of you, would, is it something that's feasible for Dunedin? Um, yeah, I, I really like the idea of it, but um, I'm wondering, is it too difficult to start developing it now? Like, you know, the way that Dunedin is all um, spread out and things are far away from each other, is that something that we can really change now? And the bike lanes are so narrow, I don't know whether that would require widening the roads that we have now or narrowing parking space. It's, it seems quite difficult. These are valid, valid concerns, yeah. Also, the um, two main, well, the main highway that goes through Dunedin goes right through the middle near the hospital and quite close to the centre of town. So it is, at the moment, a very viable option to use cars to get places, especially from out of town. So if we do have to um, move away from transport like cars, we would have to think about the dynamics of making better bike lanes and better um, bus lanes. And the hills make it very difficult as well, since Dunedin is such a hilly city. I wouldn't like to cycle home because I live on a hill and I'd be cycling uphill the whole time. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I also just add, I think like pub, uh, active transport for me, like walking places uh, from my house especially, is quite difficult because I'd have to walk about for 50 minutes or an hour, I think, to get to school. So it's not really an option. And then again with the biking, I would have to bike all the way up Rattray Street. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, <laughs> it's not fun. Not fun. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. 
So, Connor, I'm curious for you as the only driver here, um, yeah, I guess what motivated you to get your license and also what are like the economic <coughs> influences, you know, how does the cost of having a car affect? Um, well, the cost of having a car is that it's a real catch-22 sort of thing. Um, having a car enables me to go places when I want to. I don't have to rely on public transport. Um, mm -hmm. I can go out in the rain. I don't have to worry about getting wet or maybe catching a cold. Mm -hmm. um, but the downside to that is I have to um, put funds that could go towards my university studies. I have to put those funds into um, maintenance, petrol, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and also I have to give up on things like um, buying a new jacket or buying a new mm -hmm. set of pants or that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, so there are real pros and cons of owning a car. Um, I haven't done any sort of um, analysis into if public transport would be more feasible, but um, yeah, having the freedom of a car is definitely good, but it comes at a cost, yes. Mm -hmm. um, what motivated me to drive was, um, <coughs> it was just sort of a natural progression for me. Just, it will be easier on my parents because they wouldn't have to chauffeur me around the place. But also it gave me, again, it gave me options as to um, what jobs I could have. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one summer, um, in the summer break, I had a job as a labourer, mm -hmm. and the foreman on the site asked me to move the truck, and I just couldn't do it. I just, yeah, and that mm -hmm. was actually a wee bit humiliating for me. Yeah. So I just thought, well, I need to have the option there, so I can actually say, yep, I can move the truck, or yes, I can go do this. So mm -hmm. it, having a licence and knowing how to drive does open up options. Mm. I think you mentioned another really key thing there. Um, on your parents and, and mm. I mean open to anyone as well like what sort of um, influence does your parents play in, in your decision to drive or not to drive? Um, well I'm really lucky because my parents like to drive me places according to them they like to drive me places <laughs> um, they say they like to spend time with me in the car so um, I don't think I've ever been turned down when I've asked for a ride um, it might help that my dad's retired, he does his own things in the daytime, but <laughs> mum drops me at school on her way to work and dad comes and picks me up after school. Yeah. Um, my parents are keen for me to get my licence, um, not so they can not chauffeur me around, or at least that's what they tell me, um, <laughs> but they want me to have some kind of degree of independency and also my dad wants to buy me a car. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> as, as a status symbol? Oh, <laughs> like as a... I, I wouldn't see it as a status <laughs> yeah. symbol. I don't see anybody as more important just because they have a car, especially in a high school setting. Yeah. I don't think I yeah. see somebody as more cool oh, if, if they have a car. Mm -hmm. no. um, yeah, I don't think my parents are really too worried about whether I get my licence immediately or not. They seem to be happy to drive me around places. Occasionally I feel like a bit of an inconvenience to them. But so do I. Yeah, other than that, I don't think there's really any problem with it at the moment. Can I, can I ask um, all, all three of you, what percentage of journeys that aren't to and from school do you make entirely independently? Um, I would say about 95% for myself because I have a part time job and I play numerous sports, so I think, yeah, the bulk of my journeys are self directed. And how do you make them? Um, I have my own car. So you drive yeah. yourself? Yeah, I drive myself. And what about you girls? I would say about 3 to 5 per cent I make by myself. Um, I'm usually driven by my parents taking the bus. Um, until recently I didn't actually know how to catch a bus. Um, so it used to be something I did a couple of, once every couple of months. Um, I do walk places. Um, that's generally downhill because I live on a hill and school's on a hill. So if I want to walk into town or I'm walking to the library where my mum works, I walk there and then we drive home together. <coughs> Um, maybe about I don't know, 30% for me. I catch the bus sometimes to school in the morning, but I catch it home from school every day. And occasionally if I'm going into town to go shopping or something, I'll catch the bus in. But um, other than that, going to friends' houses or um, going to the supermarket or the shop or somewhere, um, my parents will take me. So, yeah. What, what do you think about the buses in Dunedin? What are they like? Yeah. Tell us about your experiences on the bus. <laughs> um, well, personally, since I don't have that much experience with buses, um, 
but in general I find them to be quite hostile to me. I think they're quite a hostile environment. Um, I did have a go card because I shifted houses and it was going. I was going to need to transport like regularly on a bus, so I got a go card um, and you f- you load funds onto that and then you scan it when you get into the bus. Um, but I found zones really confusing. If you get on the bus and you say two zones, I have no idea how to do that. So I get on the bus uh-huh. and I say to the bus driver, "Oh, could you please tell me how many zones it is to here?" Um, and the few times I've done that, um, I don't get much of a accommodating response, but I'm sure that's only one or two bus drivers. Um, they don't seem happy that, like, I try and prepare myself. I talk to my friends beforehand. I'm like, how many, how many zones is this? I don't want to inconvenience the driver, but it's not a very nice experience. I don't enjoy it very much. Yeah. And you mentioned, um, Anna Marie, that you, you don't, you're too far for walking and biking, so you take the bus. What are your experiences on the bus? Um, well, I catch the Shield Hill bus. And that's pretty good during the um, weekday, and I know when they come because I've got that um, memorised. But like during the weekends, Saturdays and Sundays are awkward, and I mean I can understand that because you don't want to have drivers working um, on Sundays um, all the time. But they come by the hour, so that is sort of inconvenient if you want to get somewhere on time. And um, the St Clair bus is very good, that comes every 15 minutes, um, the bus stops are really regular but uh, other buses don't seem to be as good as that, Like they could do with having more frequent bus stops and other than that, um, the maps, the timetables are pretty hard to follow, they've got little um, dashes and arrows and things through them, um, so route variations are difficult to follow. Um, and. They uh, don't actually indicate every single bus stop. They only have the major bus stops, so that's pretty hard to follow. Um, I'm pretty hopeless at reading maps myself, so it would be helpful to have, I don't know, recognisable landmarks on it, Um, maybe more streets, so that you can more easily locate where you're trying to get to. Recognisable landmarks would be cool. Yeah, Yeah. so it would be good. I think the main problem with the bus system is is, um, the the old economics of scale. We just don't have the, the... the demand in Dunedin to have buses coming every half hour or every um, 45 minutes. We don't have that demand for it. So that's why it's not it's such a good um, transport system as, it, as in um, maybe Wellington or maybe Auckland. So, I th- yeah, we sort of need to get more people onto the buses in order for that whole sort of mode of transport to sort of develop before we can actually... That's yeah. a very good point, actually. Kind of, what would you see as the way to get people on buses? Um... Well, I guess what Charlotte and Anna Marie touched on was um, inconvenience. A lot of people are sort of like, oh, well, I don't know how far I have to go. So I think if buses were more user friendly, mm-hmm. like I, um, I think we discussed this in one of my meetings, that in Wellington, you zap your card when you go on the bus and you zap it again when you go off, and how far you travelled, sort of like a taxi service. Yes. You get, ta- um, you get charged by how far you actually travel. So I think that would be a better alternative. Mm-hmm. I think it would be a better sort of um, yeah, way to interact with the bus system. Instead of having to dictate oh, yeah. the zones that you're having to travel. Can yeah. I just add something? Of so, course, yes. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a good idea to actually encourage buses as they are at the moment or not, because um, like, should we be going towards more of an inf- environmentally friendly option rather than... Like um, in Wellington, don't they have um, electrically run buses? So maybe something like that would be a better alternative than putting money into changing the current system. Do you have a question to add on to that? I was also just going to say that I um, just comment. <laughs> um, in Nelson, for a while, we were trying to promote the use of smaller, more environmentally efficient buses because we were in a similar situation as Dunedin where we didn't have um, as many people, obviously, that were re- willing to jump on every step. And what was the point of seeing giant diesel buses around when they only had two or three people in them? So, yeah. Um, Go ahead. Can I add one yes. um, I guess if we look at the bus system, a bus can carry, what, maybe 20 people? So if you look at it this way, um, that could almost be maybe 15 cars people aren't taking, assuming that they, the people on the bus do have their licences and do have their cars. Mm-hmm. So if we don't, you know, presumably a bus won't um, emit as much um, greenhouse gases as 15 cars. So I think that environmentally in the long run it probably would be more sort of um, viable. Yes. Yes, if they were if they were used as you suggested, yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. that could be an environment uh, a better environmental friendly option like you're to talk, that you're looking for. Um, um, 
What? What, so, you, I'm curious, I mean, you've obviously got a few suggestions on um, perhaps how you could make the buses um, better. Mm-hmm. Had you thought at all, or were you encouraged by anyone to put those suggestions forward to, say, council? Or, or I mean, what's your opinion on how you've engaged with, like, some of the people that might make those decisions on behalf of Dunedin? Um, I haven't really. Mm-hmm. It hasn't occurred to me. I guess it hasn't really been accessible. Like, mm-hmm. There's no one out there that sort of says, oh, you know, come to us if you want to have something to say. Or, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Personally, I don't think I've ever come across someone saying, come and tell us your suggestions. Um, but I do know, like, I would go on their website or I'd, I would ring the number and go to the customer services agency and I assume they would direct me to the right like section um, if I had something to tell them. Um, I don't think I, I would feel welcome as a teenager. Um, yeah, I'd, not that my opinions weren't valid, but I just felt like um, maybe I wouldn't be that welcome as a teenager. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like that too, I think. Yeah. L- uh, let me ask the two of you, and we know Connor is the only driver on the panel, why haven't the two of you gotten your license at this point? Um, I think it's a whole bunch of reasons, really. Um, I just haven't really got round to it. It's low on my priority list. Um, I'm also slightly worried that I'm not going to be good at it. Like, I'm going to crash. I don't really back myself to do it. Um, it's not really a necessity for me. I've got my parents to drive me around places. Um, I can catch the bus. Um, I feel like it's something I can put off until later. And I also see it as a bit of a chore. Like, it's not actually mm. something I want to do. It's just something that would occasionally be useful to me. So, um, but yeah, I see myself eventually getting my licence. I feel like, especially around Dunedin, it's something that I need to have because public transport isn't always going to be able to meet all my needs, like in emergencies or going to visit friends out of town or going on a holiday or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. I have um, many of the same reasons as Anna Marie because my parents are so accommodating it hasn't been something I need to go and get um, and they haven't told me to go and get one either so I don't feel forced or pressured into getting it. Um, Actually I've thought about it and driving holds no appeal. I don't, particularly the same as Anna Marie, I don't feel like I would quite trust myself on the road. Um, I don't feel like I'd want to be on a road where there's quite a lot of road rage as well. I don't feel safe. It's quite a bit of a problem of people not indicating in Dunedin as well when they're turning and you don't know what they're doing. Um, and it just it just holds no appeal. There is the bus if I really need to do it and um, walking is better for you. So, yeah. Now, um, I yes, ask please. One more question. Yes. How far from school do each of you live? Um, Anne Marie and I live in approximately the same area as Anderson's Bay. Um, so we're on, we are on the other side of the harbour to our school. Um, our school is up in sort of Roslyn area. Yeah, well, a wee bit below Roslyn. Um, but we live on the other side of the harbour across Portsmouth Drive and Andy Bay. So walking to school is. Yeah, it's not a viable option, if, unless you want to get up at 7 o'clock or 6.30 <laughs> and, in the morning. Um, to, in the car, yeah. it's about 10 minutes or, I don't know, 12, 13, if the traffic's sort of congested. And um, I live in Mary Hill, so I'm just a, I just drive across Highgate and down. It's about a five-minute drive, or sometimes less than five minutes. Um, I could walk, I suppose, but that would take that would take longer, and um, I'm not that keen on getting up earlier than I already do. Um, and it is quite convenient because my mum's route to work is on the same route, so she just drops me off on the way. Um, Adam, had a question? Yeah, just in terms of why you don't have a license and drive and not driving as much. Um, one thing I've been hearing recently from, I guess, older researchers studying teenagers is that. Oh, the youth want to be connected more, so they don't want to drive because then you can't be connected all the time. And that's one of the reasons that they wanted to take public transportation. So here's my chance to ask. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <youth>. Exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, do you have a, do you have this desire to remain connected? Is that one of the reasons that you wouldn't want to drive as much? Not at all. Um, Not well, at all. Not I don't think I'm age. so connected to my phone that I would resent ten minutes in the car or something driving mm. somewhere. Um, I don't think it's because of that. No. Doesn't no. doesn't hold true in my mind, at least. Yeah. It's not something. <laughs> yeah, and to be honest, I don't actually do the social media thing, like with Facebook and stuff. 
I'm a bit of a um, hermit, <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I don't really do that. So yeah, I, I always question that, you know, mm-hmm. that that image that the youth are really so connected all the time. But but then I look on the streets and they're all on their phones, so I wasn't yeah. wasn't too sure. So mm-hmm. it's nice to hear your perspective on that. Thanks. Um, yes. I was wondering if you could ask, um, tell us a bit about your history. Did you walk to primary school or did you participate in a walking school bus? Or does your family go for walks or tramps? Or kind of what is, how is walking discussed in your family? Um, well, I live very close to my old primary school. It was about five minutes to walk to school. So we always walked to school. And... Um, I remember doing a program at school. It was like a, um, I don't know what you call it, but it was like, you know, you bring your scooters or your bike to school, or, and you're actually encouraged to do that. And um, I remember that being good. And all the kids got into it because there's prizes and, and you get things for it. Um, yeah, my family is into walking. We don't actually go walking as often as we used to. But um, I take myself on walks for exercise quite frequently, just around the street. But I don't actually walk to get places very often just because I'm not close to places that I need to get to, really. Um, I lived quite far away from my primary school, so we did drive to primary school. But I had the same day, the bring your cycles and scooters to school day, and that was really nice. And we had cycle racks for the bikes, so it was quite encouraged at my primary school. Um, my dad used to hunt for a living, so I used to be out in the bush and walking around. So um, mum and I go for walks at night, and um, we've, we're in a tramping club. We just recently went tramping together, so they have a tramping club at school, so we like yeah. to do that. Um, in my family, I've got a younger brother and a younger sister. So, mum, out of sort of um, thinking about the safety of my younger sister, she would take all three of us to school and drop us off maybe a couple of blocks away, and we'll just walk to school, rather than walking all the way across. Um, yeah, for maybe half an hour to school when we were mm-hmm. five years old. Um, me and my my dad and my brother and myself, um, we do go out hunting occasionally. So that's usually walking around um, sort of yeah hilly terrain. So there is a walking element in our family, but, yeah. Do you also think this kind of connects to how you view not getting your licence, or is that the car is less important for you because you had this positive experience um, as younger? Um, not really to do with the act of transporting. I'd have to say um, it's probably more the fact that I've been encouraged to take the bus mm-hmm. that... Um, yeah, has contributed to me not getting my licence. If I didn't take the bus, I may have my licence now. Yeah. I do view walking in quite a positive light, but it hasn't influenced me not to catch a lift somewhere or take the bus. But there was also the factor of stranger danger. When I was younger, my parents really weren't keen on me walking anywhere by myself or catching the bus. Um, and I don't think I was that keen either. I was quite shy. So. Um, well... With the group of friends I have, it's sort of a, or it's a competition to see if you can get the license first. You know, it's just the whole sort of, um, I guess, um, masculine alpha male kind of thing. You know, yeah. So um, that's sort of what drove me to get my license, just to sort of be have the edge over my friends, sort of thing. That, that was a big influencing factor as to why I got my license, as well as um, it gave me options, and it um, it also removed an element of. Um, Stress from my, from my um, parents' lives because they didn't have to transport me anymore. They could focus on my brother and sister. So, if, so when I got my license, I was independent for my own transport, and that just removed a big element of um, their time and what yeah they could devote to um, well themselves and to my own brother and sister. Talking about that peer pressure issue with Connor's, all his friends have their licences. Um, none of my friends have their licence if we're mm. if we're not counting Connor. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, none of my friends who are girls have their licence. So, yeah, it's um, so there's been no pressure there whatsoever. That's the same with me. I was actually just going to add that um, it's been good with none of my friends having their licence either because I think if they did get their licence, I'd feel pressured to get mine. It would make me feel like less independent and lagging behind the pack. Yeah. yeah. So, Ty, did you have something to ask? Um, yes. First of all, I want to say you guys are great. <laughs> Aren't they? Really I think they're great too. <laughs> because so far, it's been adults trying to figure out what, you know, what influences young people and what, what you want. 
And I think it's absolutely important that we hear from you what the perspectives are. And certainly, um, you know, we're not judging you. I, I, I certainly want to reinforce the idea that there's nothing wrong with getting a driver's license and, you know, in, in, in your own circumstances, it definitely makes sense to travel by car by certain trips. But in most people's lives, there's a certain amount of flexibility. There are some trips that could go either way. And you are in a unique position to inform us what, if, if you were in charge of a marketing program, so you are trying to promote um, use of walking, cycling, and public transit for some of the trips that are currently made by car, by you know, being chauffeured or, or, or you getting your driver's license or whatever, do you think you could do it? Do you think that the three of you and the, the next panel, could you figure out a marketing campaign that would make walking, bicycling, and public transit more popular, popular and, and, and common by young people? And if so, what would that look like? What are the components of a marketing campaign to do that? It's a tough question. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, I don't think it's a very good answer, but um, I think just getting the information out there, mm. what the alternatives are. Like before today, I, um, like with the Dear Stacey talk, I wouldn't have even considered biking to get there. Like, um, maybe, I don't know, a leaflet could be sent out to people actually saying, um, you know, showing them you need better planning. Like often, we'd make an extra trip down to the supermarket because, oh no, we've forgotten something. Mm -hmm. So that isn't, you know, we could have avoided that quite easily. And yeah, just the active transport alternatives and yeah, how people can build their lives around not using cars so much or not having a car would be really useful. And on a related issue, do you think that emphasizing the environmental issues is key or is it, are there other hooks that you would use if you're, if you're working with young people to change behaviour? Would it be I, environmental? I think the or environmental it... factors yeah. are quite yeah. important. It's the consequences of our decisions. And also, um, when Brittany mentioned the NZQA, the NCA syllabus before, I don't want to criticise NZQA, but um, we haven't actually yeah. been exposed. <laughs> we haven't actually been exposed to that much of the environmental awareness. I mean, we have social studies up to year 10, so you're... You're what? Mm. How old are Which you? no one likes. You're 14, no one likes it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at our age, I, I don't get at school exposure to, to environmental awareness or the consequences of our actions, and I really think that would be an important factor to that kind of um, media or, or like a hook to get people to get involved, how we can what contribute. Health, health and obesity, is that, would that be a, another hook? Yeah. Would that be equal or less important than, than environmental objectives? I think that would probably come secondary to yeah. In yeah. the environmental issues, but that could definitely be a motivating factor. Mm -hmm. It sort of depends. Um, a lot of the guys I sort of hang out with, they're sort of um, at the stage in their life where they want to sort of get sort of <laughs> sit in the gym and um, do weights. So um, having to take a bike or walking to the gym, which is well, it's quite a distance for some of us that live across the outside town, um, that isn't really a sort of I don't know. It's extending your workout. Oh, yeah, but not, you don't want to be tired when you get there. You, want, you don't want to get there and go, oh, no. and then go home again. You know? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think it depends what sort of health. Like, a lot of guys I hang out with, a lot of people in our form at school do participate in sporting activities like basketball, not so much rugby, um, netball, football, archery. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so um, I think that our form, well, a lot of people, that we do go to school with, and a lot of people in our peer, our peers, are actually physically active. So I don't think, um, yeah, health would be such a motivator for them because they just yeah. think, well, what's the point? I have basketball training three times a week in a game on Friday. So I mean, most people we know are active yeah. in some type of sport. And this is just not people at our school. This is people. Um, in my brother's age group, he's 15. He, um, a lot of people mm -hmm. that he goes to school with are physically active. My sister, who's 11, or all, all of her friends play basketball in a rep team. Um, <laughs> So I don't think um, a health sort of perspective or a health sort of motivator would be a good marketing campaign. Environmental campaign, yes, I think it would be good, like um, that quote before um, about the Arctic ice caps. Yeah. I think that is a real sort of shock quote. 
I think things that actually make people aware, not just stats like, oh, and tw- yeah, just not hypothetical stats or just stats. Mm. Let's say by this year, the sea mm. world have risen this much, the air temperature is going to be. Stats aren't yeah. Really gonna help. I think just um, short sort of snappy stats that are really shocking would be a good marketing campaign as to why um, students and our peers should um, consider taking other transport options, not just vehicles. And, um, well, can I follow yeah. that up with one quick question then? Yeah, sure. Okay, so you are a perfect subject for this experiment because, you know, you're a typical young man. So, is there any way to channel that love of sports into utilitarian cycling. So let's assume that your city became a little bit more bicycle friendly. So there were, it was safer, a little safer to, to bicycle around. Do you think you could, you could make it, are there ways that, that your community, that you and your friends would consider bicycling an important, just like you're getting your driver's license is important, that getting a decent bicycle and going out bicycling and that you could ask girls out on dates on a bicycle. Do you think that that could be done? I don't see why it couldn't be done. Um, <laughs> when we were young, look yeah. like, I should say. Um, before we were young, when um, me and my friends were younger, we used to go mountain biking quite frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, we would go up to Nichols Creek. We'd sometimes um, bike out to Outram through Mosque, well not through Mosque, but um, yeah, around the back of Flagstaff. We'd do that occasionally. Um, yeah, I think it could be a viable option um, to sort of promote that. But then, yeah. Well, like Jamie, sorry, what Jamie mentioned, there was a cool factor, you know, when she was working with secondary schools in Canada, that there was a cool factor that went away um, when you reach a certain age. Is that the case that you've seen, that it's just not cool to bike? I think perhaps when you're 13 or 14, oh, I've got a car, that's so cool. Um, But as you get older, it becomes a normal fact of life that some people in the air have cars, some people don't, and it doesn't make a large difference in who those people are, so... So I don't see why. So it wouldn't be an, a, a barrier. Coolness wouldn't be a barrier. No. no. Okay. And um, one thing for that media campaign or the campaign to get people into it, I think it'd be quite good if we can imbue teenagers with a sense of worth, like they have something that they can say and that their opinions matter, um, or maybe just make it more obvious that people want to hear our opinions. Yeah. I don't feel like it's obvious that people want our opinions. It's yeah, I think that would be good. Well, we yeah. appreciate your opinion. Yes, <laughs> we do. Thank you. Um, if I could just expand on that. Um, a lot of stats that um, teenagers hear is teenagers account for X amount more um, crashes than mm. other people. Teenagers cause this much damage. Teenagers do this, this. And a lot of it's very negative. So I think we start maybe um, promoting positive statements like teenagers can do this or teenagers mm. are the next generation and teenagers will have to deal with this, well, can deal with this. I think we start um, saying positive statements as opposed to negative ones. Teenagers will think, hey, we can actually achieve something. Yeah. Making, us, yeah. making us aware of global cool. responsibilities in the future because mm. we don't have much of an idea of those in yeah. general education that we get in schools. So we shouldn't have named this the decreasing car use among, among teenagers symposium. We should have called it the increasing your options for travel <laughs> symposium. That's one thing I'm, we're learning today. Okay, that's a great statement. Thank you. <laughs> Can I comment quickly on that as well, Todd? Um, I have a little brother as well, and when he was between maybe 10 and 14, he loved BMXing because it was the cool thing to do, and that's typically what boys of his age at the time were interested in. Um, but our driving age here in... New Zealand is 15, so as soon as he turned 15, that fad changed and they got they started buying cars. Um, so I guess my question for the team panel is, um, ha- what would happen if the driving, the license age changed? How would that influence your lives and other people that you know that already have their licenses? Well, it did change a while um, back, didn't it? It's 16 it did change. Now. It's 16 yeah. now? Yeah. You could get your learner's license when you're 15, but um, they got changed to 16 years last old. Year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. I think it was last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what well, if it was put up to 18, for example, yeah. like in um, Europe? How would that affect and you? Like- Personally, I just think it would just press prime it. Mm. Like, yeah, they might be into BMXing for a long period of time, but eventually they'll still get a car and just think, <coughs> yes, for the car. car. Yeah, okay. but I think it would just press prime it a wee bit. Um, that's just based on what I feel and um, how my mates feel about it. Um, I can't honestly speak for every single um, male that no. in my age group, really? so I'm just speaking from um, <laughs> yeah, what little social group I have. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, you know, when you get your learners, do you have to sit on that for six months or something? Yeah, you have to le- actually learn how to drive. Yeah, that gives you a bit of a <laughs> <laughs> that gives you a bit of a sense of urgency though, because my parents are saying, oh, you better learn the theory and get onto it because you're going to have to wait six months anyway before you get your actual license and so it's just a it's a time delay so I do feel a bit of a sense of urgency now because I'll have to get that and then wait and then get my restricted and and by that time I mean if I wait until I'm 20 it will take me a while to actually get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. There is a certain age um, though where it's, um, I think it's 22 if you get your learners and then you wait six months you can get your restricted which is where um, your restricted license is where you can drive yourself around you can't take passengers unless you have a supervisor but you can drive yourself between 5 o'clock in the morning and 10 o'clock at night. Um, yeah, I, th- I think it's when you're 20... Th- yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think, I think it's when you're in your early 20s. You can... Um, yeah, you don't have to wait um, a year to get your full licence where you can mm-hmm. take passengers. Um, you can just sit your full licence whenever you want after your um, mm-hmm. restricted licence. So I think um, the whole sort of time period is cut down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's not as urgent. You just do it in your own time. I don't think I want to yeah. um, I think it could be a positive thing to increase the age um, until you can get your driver's licence. But then at the same time, um, there are some people that may actually need to get their licence, like people who live out of town, and that's sort of denying them the right to be able to get their licence and it might put them at a disadvantage. We have about five minutes left with this panel. Is there anything that you want to talk about that you haven't had a chance to talk about because you have so many questions for you? <laughs> you guys are doing great. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I'd be interested, um, a number of you talked about how Im- impactful it was to have a day where you could bring your scooters and bikes, and I have children and they like that too, but it was one day. It was one day. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of uh, it, it surprised me. But uh, second, it, it, Secondly, I was wondering if you could copy that for senior school, uh, high school students by having a take the bus to school day and maybe even do it once a term. Because part of what you're telling us is you don't really know what an alternative embodies until you try it. Yeah. You know, there should be nothing wrong with biking up hills, yeah. but we think that it's a real drag and we don't do it. But bikes are made to go up hills. There's, <laughs> that, there's yeah. absolutely nothing wrong with biking in a hilly city. But, but until you try it, you don't know. And until you put your gym gear on the back in your homework, you don't know. But just taking it one step at a time, do you feel that high school students might respond positively if you had to take, a bus, take the bus to school day? Um, Depends on the incentives. Yeah. I think if, with certain incentives, I think they might feel like they're being babied and that, oh, I'm not mm. going to do this because they're patronising me or something like that. They might yeah. not do it just out of spite. Or apathy, um, yeah. Or apathy. They might just think, why should yeah. I make the extra effort? Um, or they might think, oh, I have too many responsibilities. I have to pack my bag in the morning. I have to go. I, maybe I have, like, rowing training before school or something. I can't, I can't catch the bus. But if you had incentives that really encouraged them and maybe you gave them some information on the consequences of their actions, like catching the bus instead of the car, I think that might work. I guess also if, you're, um, if you get enough people on board, they could um, travel to school with their friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that would, that's always an incentive. If you have someone doing it with you, then you have someone to talk to, you have someone to laugh with, and that's definitely a way better incentive than just doing it individually. Mm. So I think if you do it, um, yeah, <coughs> maybe not necessarily by area, but if you could sort of get friend groups together, it would definitely be a good option. Yeah, I don't think it... Obviously, it would have to be quite different to the way you'd run it at a primary school. Like, I don't <laughs> think you'd do the sort of, like, even offering incentives. I think that would sort of just make people feel like they're being bribed. Mm. And, mm. yeah, I like I, Charlotte's idea of um, using the information side of things. Like, by the time that we, um, we've got to this age, we want to know things and we're starting to question things. And it makes us feel... I, I don't know, more important if we get told the information too. So. Yeah. Oh, yes. I was wondering what do you think would happen if you would get a free bus pass and you could ride as often as you want the bus? I'll, I'll take the bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, instead of paying for my own car, I would, I would take the bus. Yeah. But, um, oh, sorry, Charlotte. Um, provided with that, it would be good to um, improve the system of um, like the timetables mm-hmm. and information about the bus too because it is quite off-putting not knowing how many zones you're going not knowing how to find your way 
so that would been, um, need to be improved as well. And that said, I have credit on my go-card, the bus card, um, and that's been lying on there for months, and I have no want to use it on the bus yeah. the bus system. I don't enjoy the bus system at all. It's quite a nervous thing, actually. Maybe I just don't like buses, but, yeah. Well, recently um, I got a flat tyre on the way to school, and it could cost me up to um, $200 to get the tyre replaced. Yep. Unfortunately, it didn't cost me that much, but... Um, Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, anyway, if I caught a bus, I won't have to worry about that maintenance. Like, oh, I've yeah, I've got a flat tyre, I have to pay for that, or I've accidentally, well, someone's um, re-entered me, that's been some close to the back of you. I have to, um, yeah, sort out all the insurance stuff. Um, if you um, do take a bus, that whole sort of, um, I guess, responsibility is um, out of the question. All you have to worry about is, mm -hmm. yep, paid for it, get there on time. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about all the other behind-the-scenes stuff, like... Um, registration warranty that sort of thing so I think um, yeah if we do receive a free bus pass I think a lot of people would definitely say yep uh, that's definitely for me and is that myth of doing your homework on the bus true because it's quite time saving <laughs> to do our homework on the bus I, re I read on, on the bus cars, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's about time to switch out panels any other any other comments before we? Um, I mean, you can still comment from one thing. Yes. I think it was mentioned earlier that um, having more active transport would help give um, teenagers more independence, and I think actually teenagers view having a car. Well, teenage boys especially would view having a car as having more independence than um, going on a bus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because um, then so, you're tied to somebody else's schedule. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, also that um, teenage boys are probably like the most important target group for trying to decrease the car use because, you know, they want to have cars to um, be seen to be cool um, in their friends' groups and, I don't know, take, take girls out or do boy racing or whatever. Yeah, so it, boy racing. Yeah. Boy racing. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. yeah. Decreasing, um, decreasingly, cars are seen as a status symbol. It's um, the whole sort of, I have a licence, I have the ability to take, drive, I have the ability to take passengers. That's more seen as a status symbol these days than actually physically owning a car. Like, um, for example, I own a car, but I can't drive people on it, and that doesn't really matter. But one of my friends, he has his full licence, um, he uses his parents' car, and he's got a way better sort of social status than what I do, so... Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can so, take people with him in his Yeah, so it's the whole sort of ability to, yes, I can... Um, I have the ability to um, take you places, um, I could help you out. Um, and that sort of attracts more people to him, and that gives him a better status symbol. So, um, decreasingly, the actual physical ownership of a car is... Um, yeah, it's not seen as a status symbol that much these days. Thank you. One of the alternatives that many communities, not so much in New Zealand, but in, in, the, in the States and in Europe are trying, are uh, shared cars, mm -hmm. uh, zip cars and, and that kind of thing. Uh, would that solve a lot of the problems if you had access to a car on demand to take people around, to, to go on dates, but then you wouldn't have all the burden of ownership and all the other responsibilities? You think that's viable here in New Zealand? Yeah, but I think it's viable, just so long as, yep, that's absolutely viable. Just, um, so long as little implications like um, uh, keeping the vehicle clean, for example. Mm. Uh, make, maybe making it a no-smoking vehicle. Ground rules? Yeah, just having a set of ground rules that are obeyed, that is an absolutely, that would be a perfect option, actually. Um, I think that would be a good short-term option, but I'm not sure whether it would uh, meet the sort of, like, environmental um, requirements that would need to, you know, reduce emissions by as much as we need to. I mean, I don't <coughs> know the facts, but, um, yeah, maybe it's not good long term and we'd be aiming to develop more environmentally friendly transport than that in the future. Well, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to this panel, but they can still comment from the audience. And so thank you very much to the first panel. <laughs> <laughs>